you for that, Lord. Love on us tonight. Kiss us, amen, with the word of God. Look over the saints as they're traveling here, God. Keep them safe in coming here. No incidents, no accidents, no trauma, God. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, that the word of God will be ever flowing, flowing like rivers of living water upon the hearing of the people. Cure our hearts tonight, God. Purge us from our sins. Move first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. Things, blessing, family, love, romance, marriage, enhancement, prosperity. These things will be added to us. And so we thank you for this, God, in advance. We all come in agreement. Let the church say amen tonight. Praise God. I need you to pull out your Bibles. Luke, Luke, turn with me to Luke. Luke 9, 9th chapter, Luke. Praise God. Let's hear the word of our Lord. A reminder in Scripture. I call these tune-up scriptures just to keep you alert in God, tune up your spirit, keep you sharp for Christ. Amen. The word of God says in verse 22, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised on the third day. And if, and he said unto them, I'm sorry, and he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Not weekly, y'all, not monthly. Take it up daily, amen. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Amen. Praise God. Can we give the Lord a hand? Praise, man, for the word of God. I want to welcome everyone. You may be seated. I want to welcome everyone to tell you how you can follow us. You can follow us on Facebook. Praise God in Him Worship Center. You can also follow Marilyn on her Facebook page, Living Out Loud with Marilyn. You can follow me on YouTube, End Time Prophecy with Apostle CT3. Most importantly tonight, we'd like you to watch our In Him channel. For those that are watching, hopefully you're on YouTube. Please give some likes tonight. Share, make some comments, amen, that are favorable. Praise God. And please kindly give to the ministry tonight. You can give in three ways. You can also go to our Website, www.inhimnation.org, and click that Donate button. Click it. Good, everybody. Praise God. Then you can go to our Cash App platform, dollar sign in Him Nation. And then, of course, we have a text give platform, 954-287-3888. Simply text NHIM to that number, and a link will come back to your phone for you to be a blessing to this ministry. Sow a seed tonight, y'all. Amen. Let the Lord bless you in return. Well, I've said all I have to say. It's time to hear the word of God. Somebody say amen. The word of God is what changes lives, y'all. The Bible is the most important book on earth, period. No dispute. No dispute. Amen. Everything that man needs is in this book. Praise God. And so I want to encourage you to turn with us tonight. I want to bring up our teacher. She's back. Prophetess Marilyn, can you put your hands together for her as she comes? Praise the Lord. Good evening. Praise God. Let us get into the word of God. It is so good to be back. I've been back for a few weeks now, but this is my first opportunity to share the word on a Wednesday night, and I'm happy about that. I'm looking um, forward to uh, um, taking out some time uh, to talk about my Africa trip, uh, but we won't be doing that tonight. I think we're going to set aside um, some special time so that I can show pictures and short videos and whatnot and tell you about my experience in Africa. It was so much. I'm still overwhelmed uh, by just being over there and being out of the country and in Africa.
even when we fall short of his glory or short um, in regards of um, how we Bible teaches an immutable symptom. certain principle for example he would say well this is how the kingdom of god is or this is how your father is um when he taught a certain principle he was through a parable most oftentimes it was through a parable When you're pleasing God, when you're living, when you're doing everything right, and you, you like you're in this flow, and it's like okay, everything is happening. It's not really so much about the blessing because God will bless you even in fault, you know, because He gives a man according to his deeds of his heart. He sees our heart, He sees the motive, the intent, and He knows what it is that we need in order to be encouraged, in order to be corrected, even, you know. For example. One person who commits the same sort of sin or the same uh, sort of mis, uh, uh, trespassing as another person in Christ, I'm not talking about the worldly people in Christ, he may, you may suffer different consequence based on what God is holding you accountable for because he knows your heart. He knows that you should know better by now. giving us instruction and wisdom and all of that, ultimately what, what he is doing, his goal is, one of his goals is to keep us from what we don't want to do. You know, he corrects us so that we won't go so far away from him that we end up, you know, living a life in Christ, but we're thinking we're living a life in Christ, but we're really living as a devil from hell. Amen. <laughs> but praise God. And so tonight, I want to talk to you. I just want to rehearse. For some of you, it'll be a rehearsal. It'll just be kind of a refreshing and encouragement. And for others, it might be something that we say tonight or something that we see in the scriptures that you're seeing for the very first time. So this is instructional tonight. We want to instruct you on what we should be um, thinking about in regards of living a life that is pleasing. And I want you to remember this, that we cannot... With any type of teaching, we cannot, um, I can't, I, I don't. Okay, so, um, what was I saying? Um, we cannot, uh, we cannot what? Uh, what, you can't read my mind? <laughs> 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 
Okay, well, it'll come back to me in just a moment. Um, let's read the passage of scripture. How to live life pleasing to God. How to, how to live life pleasing God. Okay, and ask that you may be worthy of God. Amen. Did y'all hear that scripture? Word of God. We thank you for the teaching tonight. And most, uh, most important, we thank you for Holy Spirit who is here, who is our teacher. Even this afternoon, increase because you know what the people need to Jesus. Amen. 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 And so we read Colossians 1, 9 and 10. 10 really is where I wanted to show you that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And this is Paul. Um, we call this one of these, this passage of scripture in the first chapter, actually, th that prayer is an apostolic prayer. And Paul has many of them. He has one in Ephesians. There's a couple in Ephesians, but we call them apostolic prayers because they are prayers called. We know we understand that Paul was called of God and he was speaking in context with uh, the fact that he had learned that the Colossians had given their lives over to Christ. And he said, for this reason, I've heard that you love God now. I heard that you got filled with the Holy Spirit. And for this reason, I pray. And so we understand that what Paul was saying in essence is that, okay, now that you're saved, uh, there are some things that you have to do. There are some things, some changes that are going to be made in your life. There are some, some uh, adjustments you now need to make because remember in Philippians, he taught us that we are co-laborers with God. It is God who does the work in us and it does the work in our life, but we also have a part to play, right? We have to acquiesce to the word of God. We have to learn how to walk in this spirit, amen, and to be led of the spirit. We have to put off the old way, the way that we used to live in when we were out in the world. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you were angry, if you were an angry person and you settled arguments through your wrath, then you need to cut that out and learn how to be meek and humble, right? Because that's who Christ is. One of the things that I thought about as I was um, preparing this, and actually um, this has been on my heart for some time now, for several months, and that is the character of God. The whole, the whole, um, the, the point that as a Christian, as a believer, the best way that we can learn and the quickest way that we can get changed because the Bible teaches us that we have to become uh, like the image of Christ. You know, when the Bible tells us in Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter, it tells us that, that now that we're saved, we have to put off the old man. We stop doing, we stop living the way we used to live on, pur on purpose. Then we have our mind renewed and we put on the image of God or the image of Christ, right? It says that we put on Christ. Some version says that we put on the image of Christ. Some say we put on Christ, but it really has to do with what? We have to look like Christ, like we have to understand how long his nose was and how big his eyes were and what color his eyes were because we have to begin to look like him, right? No, it, it really is about character. And so if we can understand God's character his ways, the way that he uh, dealt with the Israelites when they were in sin and the way that he dealt with them when they were not in sin, the way that he encouraged them. Um, we, so we can't just be students of the New Testament and not be students of the Old Testament because the same God that was in the Old Testament is in the New Testament. Is the same God because while he's immutable, he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And cr in fact, while we're uh, one of the things I want you to be thinking about when we look at these passages of scripture is that Jesus himself was the image of God. The Bible teaches us that he was the expressed image of God. This is why he told his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. If you've seen how I've, uh, I've conducted myself, you know, if you've seen how I moved in such power, right. Um, if you've seen how I have authority over death and humanity, right? Because he had authority over death, right? He raised, Come on, Lazarus from the dead. And he raised people up that they said was sleepy or dead, right? And so it, when you see Christ in the scriptures, you see God. And so 
if you, because that's what we're doing, you know, in order to please God, we have to become more and more like Christ. That means in character. It means in thought, mindset. And that's the first thing that you need to understand as a Christian, as a believer. You know, whether you're new in the game, I don't want to call it a game, you know, but new in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God, whether you are, you know, a seasoned believer, you always have to remember that that the, what, what, what God is doing daily and what God is doing as we have to enter into different seasons, as we um, have to face different storms of life and different circumstances, and we have to go through certain afflictions and certain pain. You know, Jesus said that you will, we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because he overcame the world and he left peace with us. And so we have the promise of overcoming uh, but we still have to go through. We still have to do these things. But God uses all of those adversities and all of the afflictions and everything, every circumstance that we're in, whether it's good, whether we're abounding or whether we're abased. Some of us have been going through promotions. Others of us are being abased. We are having to, you know, do things. We're having to, like, get corrected and we're having to, like, you know, wake up with the, you know, God, am I going to have enough money to get gas in my tank? You know, but it's, but it's, our, it's for our good. We understand that he's working in all things for our good. So whether we are being abased or whether we're abound, we must understand that God is using those circumstances to change us so that we look more like Christ. And so we can think there that, you know, whatever you are facing in life, we need to do it patiently. We need to not complain. It, we need to not murmur. We need to not be so moved in our faith. Oh, God is going to, I know that he's not, I'm, he's not going to give me what I want. No, he's going to give you what he wants. He's going to give you what's best for you. And at the end of the day, we remember that he loves us. We're not working and living our life to try to make God love us more or accept us more. We are living and a life that is pleasing before him so that you can have joy, you know, right? Righteousness and that you might have peace in your life because think about it. When you're pleasing God, you have joy. There's joy. There's nothing for you to worry about. Your, your heart does not condemn you, right? When you wake up in the morning and you know that you, that, that you might, we understand that we're not perfect, that we all, you stand before God without Jesus, you're going to be burned up. Right, you're gonna be destroyed. But we understand that we have Jesus, so we can come before him boldly before the throne. But when we're not living a life that isn't if we're not living intentionally to please him, then we're waking up and sometimes if we have sin in our life or we have something that we have to overcome and we feel like we're failing, then we will feel we won't have joy, right? Because we feel like we're failing God. And or we're afraid of what's going to happen because we have that fear that God is not with us or God has not blessed us or whatever the case may be. Y'all following me tonight? Y'all with me? Amen. And so um, that being said, again, I want to just read Colossians 1, 9 and 10 again. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, what was the reason? The reason was that he learned that the people in Colossians, um, have accepted Christ and he so he says I do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God and I love this because Paul this was the very first prayer that he prayed for the clash as he realized that they just got saved. He knew it's important uh, to begin to now grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding that you might please. And my point tonight is that we, we're going to fully please God in our life. We're going to be fruitful in our life. And that's another way that we can please God is by um, being fruitful in our lives, right? And so we're not, again, we're not trying to earn God's love Loving God um, compels us to, to seek to please him. Listen to this. Loving God compels us. It compels us to, uh, to, to seek God 
uh, or to or to please him, right? Or to trying to um, and loving God compels us to seek to please God. We think that we try to please God. We, you know, sometimes we hit or miss, right? Because remember, um, you are, and this is what the Bible teaches us. This is not what I'm saying, but this is what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that that even when we fall short of the glory of God doesn't mean that we don't love God because God has given us his love. He's placed his love it, through the Holy Spirit. We have love on the inside of us, and that's what causes us to love God. So listen to this. When we fall short, don't you get convicted? It is the, it, it is the, the love of God that is the Holy Spirit who grieves when you fall short. And so the guilt, or not the guilt, but the conviction or the, the regret is, is that's the Holy So in other words, that's, that is proof. If you have a regret, if you are repentant, if you feel bad, that's proof that you still had a Holy Spirit. Because listen, when I was out there in the world doing my thing, I wasn't thinking about God because I didn't have God. But now I have God, and so if I try to live like I did in the world, I wouldn't be happy, but I would still have God. Eventually, you know, I, that's another, it's another doctrine that I would have to teach, but eventually you can. I don't believe once saved, always saved, right? It, it's true that once saved, always saved, but oftentimes people are not saved, and the, they think they're saved, but they're not, and that's when they walk away. Right. So I don't want to get into that tonight. But but the thing is, is I came across this word impaled It's different from compel. Impaled simply means it, it, it causes uh, it, 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 it uh, drives. It, it's a drive or a force. So, for example, um, if you have a financial difficulty, you would, for example, financial difficulties impels uh, a person to sink to seek more drastic means but in Christ impel when we think of the word impel and, and impel is a word compel the love of God compels you but you got to get to the place where the love of God impels you to where now you're getting because because impel provokes you it urges you and it kind of forces you drives you to, do, to rise up and do something more drastic. Because sometimes the love, just the love we have for God because we're under grace, mercy, and truth, eventually, let's face it, when you, when you repent of your sin, eventually you, get, you, you, you overcome those feelings of regret and repentance, right? And, you know, you, determining how quickly you come before God and repent and understand that once you come sincerely and repent, and ask God for forgiveness, and he promises that what? He will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And so eventually you get over that, and so sometimes we can be dormant just because we understand that God loves us, and so we may not be as urgently um, trying to live a life and changing. We begin, and then there's a lot of things that go, my mind is just racing tonight, but, or not racing, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to me tonight about, you know, there's a lot of things that, that would impel us to, uh, to, to go, rise up and do things more drastically in order for change and in order for us to live a life that is worthy before God. You know, um, when we understand that our flesh is a mess, when we understand that you don't have power within yourself to overcome your flesh. It would take the help of the Holy Spirit to help you. And this is why it's important for us to learn how to walk in the Spirit, learn how to be led by the Spirit, learn to, to hear the voice of God giving you instruction in a practical way in your daily life. You know, the Bible says, trust, in your, trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not into your own understanding, right? We trust why? Because then he will direct our path, right? And but so we, when we are led by the Spirit, we are now we're able to um, to to overcome the flesh. And you know, overcoming the flesh doesn't mean that you're going to do it in one night. 
you're not going to, it's a process. And that's why God, you know, some people, they come back to God. They come to the church because that, that's the last resource. They're facing a, a mega problem, right? You got a problem that needs to be solved. You need, you need, you need a, and, and, and you're not thinking about salvation. You're thinking about salvation, right? You're thinking about salvation. You need this thing solved in now. And God will take his time solving it. Why? Because he wants you to get rooted and grounded in the word and begin to understand that you can't just come to him when you have a problem. You need to be in him so that when you have a problem, you don't have to come to him. Because you're already what? In him. Y'all getting it tonight. Amen. And so we understand that sometimes the solving or the 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 solution uh, to the issue uh, is something that is promised to us, but it's not immediate because there is a journey. And that journey is that that's God uh, giving you the opportunity to cleave to him. Just like a wife would cleave or a wife and a husband would cleave together. Once they are married, they go off and they leave and then they begin to cleave, right? They cleave to one another. They become one with one another. And when we're in, when we get saved and when we begin, to, when we make a, a decision to, that says, I'm going all the way in God. I'm not going back. I'm not looking back. I'm surrendering to him. And I might not know how to I understand how to surrender, but I'm going to surrender. And, and it, as much as long as it takes, I'm in it to win it. Amen. And not just for a minute. Amen. And sometimes it takes us a minute to even get that right to get it that we can't be coming in and out of the doors because God is so faithful. He will eventually, you know, so give solution to your problem. And then, you know, if you don't get, if you don't cleave to him, if you don't take an opportunity to and understand that the reason why I'm going through this is because God has given me opportunity to cleave to him. He's given me opportunity to get rooted and grounded in the kingdom of God. He's given me opportunity to learn about his character, giving me opportunity to see things differently and understand that the reason why I have this problem in my life is because of some part of my character. Right? Y'all following me still? Amen. Y'all thinking, listening? Okay, thinking, listening? Amen. And so we want to, you know, um, that's the thing. The, the becoming impaled, it, it's, it, impaled means that it's a drive, it's a force, there's a sense of urgency. Uh, it urges someone to do something more drastically. Amen. So some of the ways that you know, you can be impelled just by you understanding things about God, understanding his character and understanding the call, understanding what is the call. Tonight, I'm not talking about the call. I'm not going to be teaching about the call. I'm going to um, talk to you about four things, and those four things are um, just things to, for you to think about in, in regards of living a life that is pleasing before God, and that's very simple, but we'll look at some different, a different vantage point, growing in faith. We must grow in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. We must grow in consistency and spiritual discipline, in our spiritual disciplines. And we must grow in our ability to talk about God, the things of God, and his kingdom. Amen. And I said that in a different way. It simply means that you study to show yourself approved. <laughs> That you might not be ashamed that when you have to talk about God, you have something to say. Right? But all of these things, these four things, and we can go on because the list could go on, but we don't have enough time. I can only talk about four of those things tonight. But when we think about it and when we look at these things, we can say, yeah, if, we, if I could just do these and do this more consistently, this is going to put some joy in my life. You know, this is what the Bible says. The great benefit, I believe, of like pleasing God, it brings, you know, it brings a lot of things, right? We can, we can be here all night again. Like, what are the benefits of pleasing God or leaving, living a life that is pleasing to God? I bet many of you can think of like one thing. Can you think of one thing? What is the benefit of living a life that pleases God? 
Joy. Okay, I said that one, so you don't count. <laughs> what? Peace. I, I think I said that. I didn't say it. Okay, but it's in the scripture, so that I'm getting ready to read. But okay, you count. You count too, but we count together. <laughs> Anyone else have um in, like a a thought of a benefit? of like when we we're working and we're, we're, when we're living intentionally, living in the thought process of this is pleasing God. I want to please God with my life. I want to bear fruit. I want to live a life that is worthy before him. Building faith, we're, yeah, we'll talk about that one too. And building faith is a good one. When you have faith, when you have faith that is greater than a mustard seed, right? Uh, what is that? You tend to have, that's a good one, you tend to have more compassion in your heart. And when you have more compassion in your heart, then you're more uh, apt to, to serve others rather than yourself or put others before you, especially in a relationship, a marriage relationship, and that's a good one. And compassion, you're, you're more uh, inclined to love the things that God loves because compassion is really about humanity, right? We saw Jesus in his character. He, that's part of his character is compassion. And we saw compassion, right, that he gave to the poor. We know that his heart was toward the widow and the poor and the, um, the fatherless, right? Because that's what James says is true religion. That's what religion is really, is about giving to the poor and watching the widows, those that can't help themselves. That's a good one, compassion, right? And what I say is, what I thought about for this Bible study is joy, peace, and then living righteous. Look at this passage of scripture. I want to show you two scriptures and their, um, their dichotomy. They're uh, opposed to one another pretty much. So Romans 14, 17, and 19 tells us, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not you know, partying. It's not eating and drinking. And then they were having a debate about, Oh, what do we, uh, how do we please God? Do we stop eating this sort of food and do we not do this? And he, but Paul said, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Then he says in verse 19, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. We know that Paul was a great teacher. He taught about character and, you know, look at Ephesians. He talked about, and even Romans, you know, he, he taught us how to live in the spirit, right? In Romans, he taught about the law. He taught about um, how we uh, should overcome the flesh and um, how we have the spirit of Christ now in us and it, uh, it bears witness uh, with our spirit that we're, ad uh, we're adopted but that we're loved. And, uh, you know, he's teaching all these things in Romans. And the truth of the matter is, is that when we see the kingdom of God, what we see is joy, peace, and righteousness. At the end of the day, we have joy, peace, and there's righteousness. That was, that's what the kingdom of God is. And so then other words, how to be a happy Christian is to walk in joy, peace, and righteousness. Now, how do we do that, right? Well, one thing that we have to do because the opposite of the kingdom is what? The world. So let's see what the Bible says about world. Look at 1 John 2, 15 and 17. And it says... I won't wait for you. You can come along once you get it. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world is what? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That's our promise. When we do the will of God, we abide forever in him. Amen. Eternally in him forever. And so we can see that three things in, in the kingdom of God, it's what joy, peace, and righteousness in the world. It's what the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. I'm not teaching on this tonight, but I wanted to bring that to your attention that that when we're pleasing God, when we're living a life that is worthy of him, and when we, we're intentional with it, then we will have joy. We will have peace, 
and we will be righteous and we will do righteous things. We will have righteousness. How many of you understand that it is so good to have righteousness? That with righteousness, that's how we find favor with God. Amen. We have God's righteousness. Praise God. We don't have our own righteousness. Because if my if I'm coming before God without Jesus, man, my righteousness is, 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 is as filthy rags. And I imagine some of y'all, or all y'all's is too. I just talk like I talk to my family. <laughs> all y'all's is too. <laughs> but that's the thing. But when we, but listen, when you begin to really yield over through the scriptures, and you're really saying, God, I want change. Not because, you know, it's the Christian thing to do. No, out of relationship and out of understanding that Jesus came to give us a life and that more abundantly. The only way that you're going to live a more abundant life is that you're going to have to start changing. You can't, you, look, you cannot afford to, to walk around in the kingdom of God angry. You cannot afford to walk around in the kingdom of God and expect God to be pleased if you're not doing anything about that nasty spirit, that, that nasty attitude. You know, you give eye service. You're nice. You're, you're, you know, you can be respectful, but then, you know, at the end of your sentence, you, you got eye service. Or you got body language. You can't fix your face. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a character, and it, it comes from within. Right. And so we we understand that also that we have to let go of the world because we can't. Otherwise, we won't have joy, peace and righteousness. And that's the truth. We have to let go of the world and all that is in the world is not so much the world, the things of the world. It is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. What does that have to do with the person, humanity? In other words, you know, when we, we, are we, do we have the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life? Pride, you know, pride, pride is uh, the first thing before a fall, right? And I don't want to teach on these things, but I do want to point them out tonight that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is what really being worldly is about. When you're loving the world, it's because now your flesh is caught up with lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You want it, you want the biggest house because you have pride of life. You you want uh, 10 cars because you have the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. You're eating, you go out to eat every night. All these things. Were, but God says that we can be in the world, but just not of the world amen because if we're if we're no longer in the world we're with christ praise god but we want to live out the abundant the abundant life right here upon the earth and so those four things is what i want to talk about the first is growing in faith so if we want to live a life that is pleasing before god or a life that is worthy before god one of the things that we need to be mindful of is that we have to grow in faith we know that god gives us all a measure of faith right he gives us a measure of faith and we know that we must walk by faith and not by sight that's the kingdom of god and when we come into the kingdom of god we have to understand that now we're learning about a new kingdom we we were we we're in the world and some of us we would we weren't just in the world but we were street wise we were street up right we were um from the hood see i don't know nothing about no hood okay <laughs> right <laughs> But see, but some of us were, and we're, we're worldly. We're so worldly. We're so, and all of us come in worldly. But now we have to, what we have to do is walk by faith. What does that mean? That means that we might be blind. We might not understand. We might not, you know, God says something in his word, and we might not be able to believe it or even understand it but the bible teaches us that we must work our faith that we work our faith what does that mean is that we we do as best we can we work our faith you know jesus talked about the mustard seed faith but we, really let's talk hebrews 11 and 6 what does it say 
This is why I brought up that one thing, how to please God. If you can just, if you can just understand that everything that we go through, everything that we're confronted with is our opportunity to grow in faith, right? Because James tells us that. What does he say? Uh, when you find yourselves in different circumstances and tribulations and, and, and temptations that counted all joy, right? Because faith, uh, patience works faith, right? So this is what we understand. Why? Because this is what pleases God. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him and receives him as Lord and Savior. So first thing we understand is that the way to please God is by walking in faith. We have to believe that he is the God of the Bible. And we have to believe that he did send Jesus, his son, right? We must believe, work our faith, and believe that we walk by faith and not by what we understand. We walk by faith, not by how we feel. We walk by faith, not what we know, because we are, we could be, you know, wise, you know, in regards of the world, right? We could be, you know, learned a lot out there because we had to be on our own um, since the time we've been 10, and we learned a lot. We learned how to live life, but even that, you, when you come into the body of Christ, now you have to learn a different way. And if you are not mindful that we live by faith, that the now in the kingdom of God, we live by faith. It is, in other words, faith is a commodity in the kingdom of God. It's probably the highest commodity after the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit, but we also have been given a measure of faith. I want to uh, bring you to the, the scripture here. Um, I got to find it. Okay. I'll just keep going and we'll, we'll run into it. And so uh, here it says in Romans 10 and 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we understand that we have to grow in faith, right? And we've been given a measure of faith. If Romans, uh, in Romans, the Bible tells us that we, I'm looking for the passage of scripture. Here, here it is, Romans. God says that he gives every man a measure of faith. Look at Romans 12 and three. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Y'all see that in the scripture? So you start off, everyone starts off even. We all have a measure of faith. And Paul goes on and he talks about you get a measure of faith and you use that faith according to the grace that you've been given or according to what you've been called to do, according to the good works that you've been called to do, right? But Jesus did say, uh, he, he, made, uh, he implied that faith can grow. When he would say things like, uh, I have not seen such great faith in all Israel. Woman, you are saved by faith. You are healed by your faith, right? Then he used, um, he was at all because he actually used that uh, uh, the same word. He was marveled that they, there was no faith in the land. But God has given every man a measure of of faith. Amen. We've been given a measure of faith, but we have the responsibility now to grow in that faith. We grow in the faith because we need faith for everything in our life as believers, don't we? We need faith for everything. We need faith to pray. We need faith to do what? We need faith to what? Work? To work, to do work, right? We need faith for everything. Faith, we're, the Bible tells us that we're healed by faith, right? We, we walk by faith and not by sight. We, we fight. We have to fight the good fight of faith, right? And we, we, we pray. We pray. The Bible says that, and the prayer of faith will raise him up. Amen? So we need faith in our life, but we have a measure of faith. And, and the Bible tells us that, that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Think about this. That it is the beginning. So the author is he's the beginning of the he's the one who's given you faith and that's the beginning of the faith. And he's also the finisher. So that speaks to growth, doesn't it? It speaks to uh, change. It speaks to something happening between author and finisher. 
We also can understand that it is Jesus who will help us to grow in faith, but we must grow in faith. And we must understand that he is the author and finisher of our faith. And when we remember that, we'll always go to him and look to him as we see problems and situations uh, that we have to face in life. We'll always come to him because we understand that he is the author and finisher. The Bible actually says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. And he said, mustard seed faith. Matthew 17, 20 and 21 says, so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, and he was talking to them because they were saying, well, how come we couldn't cast out that devil out of that little boy? Because Jesus, all he did was say, come out of him. And, and they were sitting there probably hemming and hawing and saying, come out, come out, you know, raising their voice and whatnot, and nothing was happening. But here Jesus, and then they asked, well, how come we couldn't do that? And Jesus said, so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, remember, we all have a measure of faith. And Jesus, they, were, they had a big measure of faith because they had Jesus. They were looking at the Son of God. They were looking at God. They were with God. And he said, it's because you're on, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, we have to look at the context of what he was saying. He was talking about a demon, right? And so he was really um, referring to the demon Right? That this kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. But he was also talking about faith. And so what he was saying is your faith, prayer and fasting boost your faith so that you'll be able to do what? Cast out the demon or that kind that could be from fasting. How many of you have fasted the, God, the, the fast that God accepts. I'm not talking about fasting. I'm talking about when you fast, the, the fast that God accepts. After you do that fast, don't you feel powerful? Man, I feel like I can walk on water. In, in fact, every I mean, for, for a long time, it just feels like wherever I go, I just feel like I'm just floating, like I'm walking on water. Why? Because if you do the fast that God accepts, you now have cut your flesh, you denied your flesh, and you've meditated on the word of God, and you're what? Your faith is boosted up to where now you're not so uh, worldly-minded, you're not so me-minded, but you're God-minded. You understand that God is in you, and you're relying upon him. If he told us to go and cast out devils, he's going to cast the devils out, right, through you. Amen? And so we... He said this, this is, in fact, what he is saying is that you must grow in faith. In fact, in James, the Bible teaches us that he gives grace upon, this is uh, chapter 4 uh, in James. You don't have to go there. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. But he says uh, grace upon grace. He gives us grace upon grace, right? But then he, James teaches us that we must submit to God, right? Then we submit to God, and then we can resist the devil. And that scripture is written in such a way to where it's not just resist the devil and he will flee. You do that one time. If you resist the devil, he will flee and he won't come back. No, he will. You have to keep resisting him. In other words, in your battle, you, the devil comes to buffet you. You understand that, right? That you're challenged. Like when, if God is dealing with something, let's say that you're, you're facing a problem, right? But he's also showed you that now this character, this is the opportunity for your character to be changed. So the enemy is coming to buffet you and challenge you to get you mad if you're a, a person who, because of your anger, that's why you have this problem, right? And so now everywhere you go, when you step out the door, the enemy is right there to what? Buffet you, right there to challenge you in that area. He's going to bring everybody in his mama, every person that has ever made you mad in front of you. He's going to cause, you know, and that's God, really. God is bringing you to the place of temptation so that you can see when you've overcome. But God says that when we submit to him, he gives us grace. What is grace? Power, right? We teach that here. It's not just favor, unmerited favor, but it's also powerful living. 
power for living, right? And so God, Holy Spirit inside of us, grace is enlarged as we're submitted to God and every as much grace as we need in order to overcome in that season as the enemy comes again and again to buffet us, pretty soon at the end of that season, you should have overcome that thing. You're now going to be like, oh, I got tempted, but I, I, I overcame. I was in a situation, but I did the right thing. I pleased God. Uh, the, the enemy, and you know, and, and this is like the fourth time, but this time, man, I did it. Now you can celebrate because, because you know what? I kept in there. I kept submitted to God, and I kept, you know, going against the devil because the devil's not just coming once. He's coming as long as he knows that he can cause you and trip you up. And I, I was speaking to someone uh, just a while ago about how if you want a person to change how they deal with you, you have to change how you respond to them. If you have a person who's always, you know, uh, trying to rile you up and because they know who, you, you know, that you get, you, you got to change the way you respond. Right? Because what's happening is, is you're responding in a way they're like, oh, I know how I, I, I know how I can get this person. But grace, get, God gives us grace to be able to make the change. Changing the way that we respond, right? That's what God wants. Because when we change the way that we respond in the way that pleases God, now he's working on our character. Y'all getting it, right, tonight? That's what he's doing. He's working on our character. So we have to understand that we have to we, we have to we have to keep resisting the devil and that's w what James is talking about in the first chapter when he says when you find yourselves in different trials and situations count it all joy why why are we counting it all joy because we know the promises is that we will overcome if we continue in the battle when we get up and and try to do it ourselves and hasten the the trial when we, we, we cut ourselves short because that's our opportunity to grow in faith, right? Because it says let patience have its perfect work because that's how faith is made, right? It's how faith is, that's how we grow in our faith. That's how we exercise our faith muscles is by uh, staying in the battle for as long as it takes. And the enemy is going to keep coming and buffing you and challenging you. But and you might fall short, but you get up. You don't get discouraged. What do you do? You get up, make sh shake yourself off, and, and be ready for the next battle. Because God promises that he's going to give you a grace even for the next battle because he gives grace upon grace upon grace. As long as you're submitted, stay submitted to God. And this is what the Bible is talking about when in the Old Testament it says uh, the, the, um, the righteous fall down seven times. But what makes them get, and, but they get up. But what makes them get up? It's grace that makes them get up. It's grace that helps them get up. It's the love of God that makes them give up, get up. It's the, it's the fact that they do want to please. They're impelled. They're not just compelled, but they're impelled with an urgency so they get up and say, no, I, you got to be sold out. You have to be so convinced and so convinced in your mind that first God, Holy Spirit, can do it. He can help you overcome and get through this terrible circumstance or this trial, right? But then also we believe that God will complete the work that he has begun in us. Amen? And so we have to make sure that we are living, that we're growing in faith. One other thing that I want to point out with what Jesus was saying about this mustard seed, of course, yes, it would take just a grain of mustard seed for some things. And then he said, we already showed you the passage of scripture in Matthew where it says that he, you know, but this kind comes out, but nothing but by prayer and fasting. And so he's telling us that faith has to grow as well. We have to increase in our faith. Right. So he's using the mustard seed because the mustard seed is. Have you, have you ever seen a mustard seed? I have to put on my glasses. I have to put on my magnifying glasses to see a mustard. It's so small. He was also implying that uh, the mustard seed, the mustard seed, when it's planted. So mustard seed being our faith has to be planted. It has to be uh, engaged. We have to walk in it. We have to utilize it. We have to practice faith. 
Amen. We got to be intentional with faith, right? That's what he was saying because the mustard seed, when it's planted, um, it it can grow. If it's planted correctly in the right um, soil, it grows to be one of the largest trees, one of the broadest trees. Have you ever seen a mustard tree? It's like broad. It may not be tall, but it's very broad. It's like the difference between Thor is broad, right? And a, a Dolmen and Pincher, yeah, a Pincher maybe is not as, it's lean, right? So I'd rather have a Thor than a, <laughs> okay, I'm just, you know, okay, Roddy, Roddy, okay. But what I'm saying is that it's it's broad, it's strong, it's it's like, it's solid. And that's what Jesus is saying. You got to have a solid faith. And we have the potential to have a solid faith. Amen. We might be wishy-washy coming into the body of Christ, but if we just get up and begin to exercise our faith, we will have a solid faith, faith so that when the enemy comes, he knows that he can't mess with us. When fear comes, you'll send your face to the door rather than yourself, right? And the enemy will get to stepping because he knows that he can't over, he cannot take you out if you have a broad faith. And so, and wouldn't that bring joy? Wouldn't that inspire peace? Amen. If we grew in our faith. And that's why I chose that we need to grow in faith. Matthew 8 and 10 says, Jesus said, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, verily I say unto you, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. He was talking about the Sahedrin soldier who um, understood who Jesus was. And he said, listen, you don't have to come to my house because I understand how authority works. I understand that you walk in authority. He believed who Jesus was. And he said, you don't have to come into my house. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Just speak the word. Because I understand how authority is. And Jesus looked at that and he marveled and he said, what great, I haven't even seen this type of faith in Israel. And opposite of that, he says in Mark 6 and 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He used the same word. He marveled because of great faith and he marveled because of unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. He had to teach because people needed to know, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to put ourselves in the hearing of the word, right? Because faith comes by hearing. If we hear the word, and you know, one thing that, you know, I, I want to say about hearing the word, you know, when we're talking about fruit bearing, Jesus um, in Mark, the fourth chapter, uh, it says, the word said, Jesus said, but these are the ones who s ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. You know, most people use that passage of scripture to say, oh, I want you to be increased, and um, as you give, you um, increase some 30-fold, uh, some, 30 fold, some uh, 60, and some 100. But that's out of context. What, well, it is principle, but it came from this passage of scripture, and it's talking about the seed, the word of God planted and sown in man's heart. And so he was saying here that if anyone here, because he goes on, and you can write this in your uh, notes. This is Mark 4 and 20. He says, but these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So hearing the word will bear fruit. You're going to bear some fruit. In other words, the word sown on your heart um, and it doesn't bear fruit right away, but over a period of time, right, over a reasonable period of time, during harvest time, that word sown is going to produce a fruit. What kind of fruit? A fruit of the spirit, the temperance, love, joy, all of those things. It's going to bear fruit for you, and then you're going to be pleasing. You're going to live a life worthy to God. But Jesus goes on to say in 23 and 24, he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, he's talking about the word, right? He was just teaching. He says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. 
And so what does it sound like? Is Jesus saying you got to study, you got to, you take heed to what you hear. You can't just come to Bible study and hear the, put yourself under the hearing of the word and expect to grow. You're also going to have to take, go home and think about and contemplate what you have heard. This is what he's saying. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version in 23. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words. Then he said to them, pay attention to what you hear by your own standard of measurement. That is to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom. This is the Amplified. Study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom. It will be measured to you. And you will be given even greater ability to respond. Ooh. Drop the mic. <laughs> right? So write this down in your notes and write the Amplified Version. You want to read it and study from the Amplified Version. Right? Because it says that, that it, when you hear the word, virtue comes back. There's a power that comes back. There's an ability that comes back with hearing the word. But, but it only is based on the level to which your virtue will come back or the level to which the power or the ability to operate in that word will come back is based on your measure of study, your, your measure of heeding that word, right? And so it, 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 he says, and you will be given even greater ability to respond and more will be given to you besides. And, and this is the thing. When you get something, when you comprehend something, when you get a revelation in regards of the truths of the scripture or the kingdom of God or God's character, that can't be taken from you. It could only, it could only increase. The more you understand God, the more understanding is coming. If you don't understand God and if you're not trying to understand God, you're not reading the word. You're not doing what it would take to, to get a greater understanding, right? But we, again, this shows that the benefit of studying the word and heeding the word does yield something. And that alone convinces you that, okay, I got to do better in reading the word of God and studying it intentionally, right? You don't have to become a scholar or a theologian, but you, we should have uh, the word of God daily. The Bible said, Jesus said that the word, um, that man should not live that, uh, by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You can hear the word of God, but not hear the word of God. You, okay, they don't get it, but I know you do, <laughs> right? You can hear the word of God, but do you hear it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith, things come by hearing. Anything can come by hearing. You could be in your car jamming to a worldly song, rap song with you know, disgracing women and disgracing the, the, um, the hood, all that stuff, that's what you're going to know. You might know that well, and you might even go online and get the lyrics because it sounds so good. Now you need to know the lyrics. And now you, that's what you understand, worldly stuff. But do you understand the kingdom of God in the one way that we can understand the kingdom of God the one way that we can understand how to walk pleasing to God is through reading the word of God and putting ourselves under the hearing of the word of God, but understanding that you are not a hearer of the word until you become a doer of the word. That's what the, 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 the Jews understood when they heard James say, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Why? Because let's look at um, James 1 and 21 and I'm going to stop here and I'm just going to pick it up next week okay and get with the other three because uh, I knew this was going to happen anyway I'm like I don't want to do two parts but you know I, I just feel like we sometimes we need to go deep right we need to talk and linger at a place right so hearing and doing the word we can't just be a hearer of the word that makes sense because I'm going to read the Amplified Version again uh, real quickly, James of um, Mark 20th. Remember, Jesus promised that um, hearing the word, the word is sown on, on your heart, it, on good ground. And depending on how you hear it and how you respond, 
is going to bring either 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. Right? And what is a hundredfold? What are those folds? That's the, the ability, the grace, the virtue, the power behind it and able to, in order to operate in that word. See, I can sit down and have a session with you, a counseling session with you, and hear what's going on in your life, and we discuss it, and we say, okay, this is the word of God. God is saying for you that you need to just, this is what you need to do. But it's not, you're hearing it, but now you need to go back and you need to sit quietly and re rehash and rethink that conversation because Holy Spirit is going to be there and he's going to further counsel you and, and commit you, help you to be committed to the change that needs to take place. But if you just hear it and you just go about your business and you expect God to do it, his part, he's going to do his part. But have you done your part? And if you haven't by the time the situation is over, when it's resolved, if you haven't done your part, guess what? You can best be sure that you're getting ready to go through it again in some other way. But God said, he just wants you to go through it once, man. I got so many in the spirit. If you saw me in the spirit, my spirit man, <laughs> right? You saw me, I would have big bruises and just from being a knucklehead, just being you know, disobedient and rebellious, trying to do things my way. When I first got saved, well, that's not true. When I first got saved, because God had it, he was doing something in my life. And so I really, I still had to learn a lot, but you know, it was, it was kinda, it was that love thing that I was impelled, not compelled, but impelled to do some things urgently. Amen. But James, um, what scripture did I want to close on? Was it James? Okay, so James, hearing and doing the word, receive. James 121 says that we have to receive the word, just like Jesus taught in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark 4, right? It says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. And so this is, Jesus, this is what Jesus, if we were to study out Mark, the fourth chapter, this is in essence what Jesus was saying is that the word is the, the seed is the word of God and it's planted on the hearts and it's engrafted into us. Why does it need to be engrafted to us? Because we can't walk around with the Bible, right? But we can walk around with the word of God in our hearts because when we're practically speaking, when we're on our walk of life, we're tempted, when we're tempted, we, we shouldn't have to like, hold on, let me run and get my Bible and see what the word of God says. The word of God should spring up in our hearts, right? Because what is Paul, uh, David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So in his walk of life, because he hid the word in his heart, he had it in his heart so that when he was confronted with temptation, confronted with people, persecutors, confronted with anything that would try to get him off track with God, the word of God sprung up rather than his own intellect, rather than his own emotions. In fact, the word of God trained his emotions. And some of us are so emotional, we just go on our emotions. <laughs> they don't like me, and then, you know, we, we do that, and that's how we live our life. That's how we make our choices and decisions, and how can you live a life that's pleasing to God if your emotions run you, even your own intellect. Some of us, we think that just because we have our PhD, or just because we have our master's degree, we're smart and no one can tell us anything. But the Bible says that we need to be humble and teachable and have a teachable spirit, right? Some of us, we, we think we're so bougie that we, we get untouchable, <laughs> right? But then we learn, it's like, okay, I can be bougie and I can be teachable, right? I can be bougie. That's just a part of who I am. And that might get me through the door, but I got to have character. I have to have some weight behind me, right? I have to have that, that broadness where I can stand strong and not be moved because this job is just not about, you know, being pretty and being smart. It's also about um, being able to um, exercise self-control in the times, right? That is really needed. And so James, he says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, humbleness, humility, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. What is, what is your souls? What is your soul combined, com, um, comprised of? 
We teach this. Come on, what is the soul? The yeah, emotions, the mind, the will, and the emotions, right? So, I, yeah, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Your will is your own intellect. It's where you make decisions. But the Bible is telling us that the word of God becomes our intellect. The word of God um, becomes uh, so much in us uh, that that we we rely on the word of God to be our intellect, to be our will, to be our our decision in life. So when we're faced with having to make two different decisions, where the word of God is going to guide us to make the right decision. We can say, oh, do I want to lean on my flesh? Do I want to be take vengeance? Or the word of God will rise up and say, um, God will remind you, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? That we overcome evil. When someone does something evil to you, you're not taking out vengeance, but you actually understand the word of God will remind you if it's in you, it's going to say that uh, that you overcome evil by doing good. And so you'll be like, okay, I need to go bake a pie or something and not eat it myself, you know. Uh, but it, that's what the word of God does. And this is why Paul, uh, David said, the word of God, if I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Your word, oh God, is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. It lights the way and it tells us where we stand, where we are in our life. But then it also shows us where we're going in our life. But look what James says in James um, 22, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So along with having to study the word, we must be a doer of the word. When we hear correction, when we hear instruction, we must make it our business to begin to um, make that change, to start changing the way that we do things, adjusting how we do. And sometimes we don't do it overnight. But what we go through that process, right? But we begin to now do it because what does it say? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. In other words, when you hear the word of God and when you see the word of God, either written or man, because sometimes we are one another's example, right? And when you hear the word of God or when you hear instruction, uh, uh, with the word of God, then uh, you see, you're able to see yourself. You're able to see yourself, but you're also able to see who? Jesus in the word, because he is the word. We get to see his character. So it's twofold. When we see the word, it's reflection of who we are, where we stand, and where we are in the kingdom of God in regards of our growth, Right? And then we also see Jesus. So we actually see where we don't line up or where we do line up, which is encouraging, always encouraging, right? Wow, I finally got it. I, I'm walking in love. <laughs> I'm loving everyone. Whereas when you came into the body, you, it was hard for you to love everyone, especially the people who got on your nerves, just urged you for no reason, right? And it says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was, absent-minded. You, you see it and you hear it and you say, okay, that's me. But if you don't do anything about it, if you don't begin to make the change, if you don't think about it, if you don't study it, you will forget that you were told that you need to make this change. Y'all get me, y'all feeling me, you're, you're with me, right? And some of you know this, this is just rehearsal to you. Some of this is, you know, something is like God is saying, this is for this season and it's, and it's urgent for you to know this. Verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, when we hear the word, when we see the word, when we read the word, when we're encouraged in the word, anything, when we encounter the word, we have to continue in it if it's correction. We have to continue in it um, if it's instruction and direction. Why? Because that's how we grow. Because one of the things on my list is consistency. We have to be consistent in what we do in our spiritual discipline. We have to grow in consistency. We can't just be, some of us, we can't just be consistent, but we grow in it. By what? Forming habit. When you form a habit, then it's hard for you not to do it, right? Because it's habitual and it's something that you crave doing, right? There's a lot of other things other than you making the decision involved in that. Now it becomes part of, like, rote. It's like part of your, it's part of your, uh, 
uh, what you've um, what you've been trained to do, right? By rote, right? It just happens automatically. And that's what God wants to get us to to the place where we're consistent because of habit. Amen. So we have to put the word to practical use, and we have to apply the word to daily to our life daily. We apply it daily, especially if we're going through, if we know that God is doing something. And it's not especially. It's every day we should be reading the word of God. We should have something on our mind that God is doing in our life. Um, we don't have to be so heavenly minded that we're not earthly good, right? We don't walk around and say, you know, I have to, I have to do this God's way because, you know, you're at work. Can you imagine yourself walking like this and saying, I'm training myself to, you know, lay my hands just right and, and I'm training myself to say the right thing. And then you're telling everyone and you're having discussion and, and that makes no sense because there's, you're talking to people who think you're crazy. Because a carnal mind cannot receive the things of God. But we do it in a practical way. The word of God um, has a way of fitting into our life. Doesn't it? And when we read it and when we make it our business to, um, to study it and rehearse it and think about it on a larger scale than what we've heard, then it becomes something that is natural. And then what you'll see is the fruit is something that you just do and you understand. It's not anything, you, you get to the place where when you're eating fruit, when you're bearing fruit, it, it is gonna look like you're doing it by rote. You're just doing the right thing, you're acquiescing, and you're not rebellious, but you are uh, acquiescing to the word of God without even thinking. Because why? It's become a part of your character. It's been it's successful. Now you're bearing a hundredfold or sixty fold or eighty fold, amen, of that word. Sometimes you miss, but one hundred percent of the times you're on you're on point. Thirty percent I would some things in my life and things I had to overcome, man, I was glad when I was yielding thirty thirty fold, right? It's, it's like it's better than no fold, okay? So the word of God works, and we're talking about building our faith by the word of God. But we can't expect that our faith is going to grow if we're not studying it and working it, right? We got to do both. We have to work the word because when we work the word, we're working our faith. And I want to stop right there. I hope you guys were blessed tonight. I know I was. It was a good rehearsal, right? For this season, this next season, we have someone who just got promoted in, on her job, and we're just so excited. Do we have any other promotions or any special things that have happened? I know that once someone just got a job, right? You just got a job. You've been looking for a while, but you got a grown folk job. Come on now. <laughs> Amen. And we have someone, can I say it? If someone just got promoted on their job, praise God. You know what? That's encouraging, right? Because if they, if God will promote them and God will give them a job and be faithful, he will be faithful with you because he is not a respecter of persons. He is a respecter of his word. And if I, I I'm, I'm sure if I, because I know both of them, I know that if I had a conversation, if I brought them up and put them on the mic, their testimony would be, oh, I've been serving God. I've been in the word. I've been getting to know who God is through his character. And the other one will say, oh, I've been standing in faith and I've just been allowing God to just change me and strengthen me so that I can, uh, so that by the time he gives me my job, I'll be a different man. Amen. Or I'm, I'll be standing in the right place when he gives his blessing. Amen. So praise God. We have to be encouraged that the word works. And what God is after is always when we're faced with something, any situation in our life, is that opportunity to grow in our faith. And when you have been found faithful in that trial, you will be promoted. You will be given the crown of life. Amen. That means you'll have authority over the thing that you conquered. But guess what? We don't stop there, right? Because we go from level to level. Someone once said one level is another uh, devil. Amen. And so know that we always have to be aware because the Bible says we have to be um, on guard, be wise as a serpent, but be meek as a dove. We always have to be on guard when it comes to 
spiritual things, uh, but we want to go from level to level. We want to go from faith. The Bible says from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Amen. Isn't that what we want? Amen. Praise God. Let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you and bless you for the word of God tonight. We thank you, Father God, for the, the word of faith and the instruction that, God, that we have to walk this out. We have to grow in our faith, Lord. And we do it by yielding to what we hear and thinking about it and meditating on it and studying out that word, God, when we hear, when we put ourselves in the hearing. Because we know that hearing, that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we know, God, that you have already told us that we can grow in faith and that we should grow in faith, that we should strive to have great faith in the earth so that you will be pleased God and we know father also that we have to acquiesce that we have to walk as if we believe God because faith without works is dead faith God our our faith has to be planted in the ground that means that we have to get out and we have to do it amen what you tell us to do and what we are expecting you to do we have to do our part father God and so we thank you for the word of faith today God and the instruction that has come behind it and we pray father God that we would make it that during the season God in every season of our life is an opportunity to grow in our faith father whatever we're facing Lord we thank you for the grace enough to make it through to each time when we're buffeted or when we're tempted or when we feel like we want to stop God we thank you hallelujah that we reminded that we have grace in order to continue that we can resist the devil as often as he comes as often as a problem shows his face God we have what it takes to overcome it in the name of Jesus and we may not be uh, overcome the first time God but we thank you that we if we continue to resist if we continue to be impelled with a sense of urgency and intentionality we will overcome father in the name of Jesus we thank you for the opportunity to grow in faith we want to live in joy we want to live in peace we want God to walk in righteousness and so we thank you and bless you for the instruction in Jesus name we pray amen amen God bless y'all tonight we will do one last thing and that is we will uh, give you that opportunity to, to give your tithe or to give an offering amen this is the time where we get excited right because we know that when we come and we have that anytime we have an opportunity to show our faithfulness to God and when we're challenged and tested because this is the time of testing are you gonna you just got that check are you gonna give the 10 percent or are you gonna hold it back because you don't have faith enough in God right what are you going to do we're not going to look at our circumstance are we because we walk by what and not by amen we we're going to walk by faith we're going to say oh no i'm doing this by faith i'm going to release my tithe i'm going to release an offering by faith because this is what god has said and i trust his word and any if i don't i'm still going to do it because i know that if i do it fruit will come Amen. And so let's give. You can give by uh, the uh, the cash app, dollar sign in him nation. You can go online, inhimnation.org, or simply uh, online. Uh, you can use the text to give number. I believe it's 954 287 3888. You can give that way as well. Amen. Father God. And we want to pray over our deacon, Henry. Um, we're waiting on the, the family to, you know, to. To disclose why we're praying but we want to pray and we want our church family um, to write his name down and bring him before God amen we want to pray for our deacon we want to pray for healing we want to pray for his health we want to pray God's blessing on him and we want to speak the word we don't want to pray was we want to speak the word we want to speak healing over him in the name of Jesus we know that God has promised that he was healed by Jesus' stripes. And we know that Deacon Henry is faithful, isn't he? We know that he, come on, if you ever encountered his, his prayer in, in Creole, amen, we know that he is a powerful somebody. He loves God. 
Uh, he uh, is, is a great example of a child of God. Uh, we know that he is faithful, amen, and he loves the Lord, and he has been serving in this ministry for a long time. He's been consistent and faithful, and we know that God is not, un not unrighteous to forget his labor of love. And so quickly, before we take up the offering, I do want to pray for him. Father God, we thank you and bless you for our deacon, Lord, and our friend, our brother in Christ, Father God. And we pray, God, sincere prayer to you, Lord, as we bring him before you. We thank you, Father God, Lord, that you're seeing what's going on. And Lord, we thank you, Father God, that your hand is on him and your hand is in this situation. And even as we've talked about faith tonight, Father, we lend our faith, we join our faith to this family, God. We surround our brother with great faith, Father God. And we believe, Lord, that just as you said, he was healed by your stripes. We believe, God, that you are capable, you are able, God, to heal him because nothing is impossible with you, God. You can do anything, God. You can do anything, Lord, because you are God. You are sovereign. You are most high, Father God. And, Lord, you are all-powerful, God. You can do a creative miracle, Father God. And so we thank you. We wait on you. Our eyes are on you because you are the author and the finisher of our faith, Father God. God, we believe, Lord. We believe you. We believe for healing. We believe for that miracle, God, in the name of Jesus. And we pray, God, we pray for the family. We pray, God, that they would stay in a place of prayer, God, and that they would, that their hearts would be comforted and they would have a place of peace, God, in you and a place of faith in you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And we curse any spirits of infirmity, we stand against any spirits and anything that has been spoken, any ill will over our brother in the name of Jesus. And we say that he rises up out of that sick bed. In fact, we say that the son of righteousness rises up with healing in his wings. In the matchless name of Jesus, God, we thank you and we hold you to your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, God bless y'all tonight. We've prayed over the offering. Did we pray over the offering? And let's lift up the offering. Father God, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the for what you have placed in our hand. We thank you, Father God, Lord, for the giving tonight. And Lord, we pray for every person who has given and those that don't have to give, God, but have the heart to give. We pray for them as well, God. But we pray, God, that every need is met here in this body, God. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those that you would pour out your blessing upon those who give even those who give with great faith father god we thank you that you're giving them great things in the matchless name of jesus father amen amen ushers if you can go ahead and get the people's offering we'll get you out of here now um just stand to your feet so that we can uh give you the blessing if you just raise your right hand um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine his face upon you and may he keep you in a place of peace. Father, we thank you that even as we have arrived safely, you will make sure that we get home safety. You bless us in our going and in our coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessings to you.